Okay, Pat, would you like me to introduce uh, Dr. Kendo now? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Pat, for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Yvette Akenda. Dr. Kendo is a medical director at Care Force First Blue Cross Blue Shield of Maryland and has been a board of certified family physician with more than 30 years of experience. After completing her residency in family medicine, she served in the U.S. Army as a medical officer, achieving the rank of major and was in both Desert Shield and Desert Storm over in Iraq. After leaving the Army, Dr. Kendo became a family physician and medical director, including working at Chase Brexton Healthcare Center in the Columbia office from 2004 to 2017, where she also served as the site medical director. Dr. Kendo has won many commendations and awards throughout her career, including being honored as the Maryland Family Physician of the Year in 2002. Dr. Kendo is also very active in the community and has held leadership roles and board positions for several organizations. Currently, she serves as the board trustee of the Horizon Foundation of Howard County and a board member of the Health Advisory Board of the Community Action Council of, of Howard County. And apparently, uh, Dr. Kendo does have some spare time because in her spare time, she enjoys long distance running and has completed 10 marathons, including the Marine Corps, New York and Boston marathons, uh, not a small achievement in and of itself. But as you can see from her buyer, Dr. Kendo is someone who's not only achieved much in her career, but more importantly, has given a lot back to our community and to our country. The topic she will discuss tonight, health equity for the Latino community in Howard County, is an area that she's both knowledgeable in and very passionate about. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kendo. Tony, thank you for that. Uh wonderful introduction. I am not a fast runner by no means, <laughs> but I, I do enjoy uh, getting out, out there. That is my, my preferred way to, to exercise is just being outdoors. And that's why I can't wait for the weather to cooperate so I can get out there. So I am a, a family physician and I have practiced my entire career here in Maryland. I, I went to school in Puerto Rico, but I came to Maryland to do my residency. And uh, uh, after, like he said, uh, I completed my residency, I paid back my time to the military because I went to medical school with a scholarship from, from the army. Uh, I practice family medicine in the same community where I live, uh, work, pray, and play uh, until 2017, which is when I retired from clinical medicine and went to work for uh, Care First as a medical director. Health, uh, and I'm here to speak uh, some about health equity in Howard County for the Latino community. Howard County is a very diverse community. Uh, it's very diverse in the demographics, the life stages, the health needs of its population. Uh, and if you can move to the next slide, uh, we are very fortunate to live in this county uh, because Howard County has been recognized in both local and national press as one of the healthiest counties in the nation. Uh, this that you see here, it, it was something that was in, uh, in 2021, it was, it ranked uh, in, the, in the top 10 in the nation as reported by US News and, Wo and World Report. M most recent, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and if you move to the next slide, I'm just gonna show that uh, is, the, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation named Howard County one of the 10 uh, winners of the 2020-2021 Culture of Health Prize for fostering health equity and inclusion. But I must pause, you know, we, we are, are known for this, but I always have to pause and think, do we really have true health equity and inclusion to all sectors of the population that resides in Howard County. 
And honestly, we do not. You know, I remember when I was still practicing how I experienced the health inequities that exist in, in the county, particularly for the Latino population. Being a native uh, Spanish speaker, I was sought out by Spanish speaking patients because, precisely because they can communicate with me in their native uh, tongue. In March of of 2020, just right after the COVID-19 pandemic had been declared, and if you can move to the next slide, uh, Nikki Highsmith, the, the president and CEO of the Horizon Foundation, she wrote an op-ed for the Baltimore Sun that it was titled, Health is Not the Same for Everyone in Howard County. And on this op-ed, she highlights uh, the release of the report the 2020 vision uh, in Howard County. And if you move to the next slide, it has a, and I think they're gonna put uh, a link to this uh, report in the chat. In this op-ed, Nikki highlighted, uh, you know, she speaks about how health is dependent on many factors and conditions in which people are born, raised and live. It includes economic stability, housing, education, transportation, and experiences with discrimination. All of these are going to contribute to health outcomes and play a role in creating health disparities. This report highlights a survey that showed Latina youth in Howard County are more at risk for depression and planning suicide while white students are least likely. It also pointed out that Latina and black pregnant women are two times more likely to receive either late or no prenatal care compared to white pregnant women. In the most uh, recent census, the Latino Hispanic population in Howard County came up about to 7.3%. Within the Latino population, you also see diversity, many different countries, Central, South America, Caribbean. But there's a sector of the Latino population that lives in the shadows, is the undocumented immigrant Latino that lives in this county. These are the people that often perform many of what we now call essential services, a title that has been commonly used during this pandemic. These are the people that work in construction, housekeeping, hospitality, food services. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on all of us, no doubt about that. But for these Latinos, the toll was dis disproportionately when compared to other sectors of the population. You can go to the next slide. On July 2021, the Pew Research Center uh, pointed out that for US Latinos, COVID-19 took a personal and financial toll. Initially, they were more vulnerable uh, to economic hardships, mostly in part for the types of jobs they hold, food industry and hospitality industry. During the initial months of the pandemic, if you recall, these industries came to a complete stop. At the same time, these uh, Latinos have been more at risk for the COVID-19 infection for a variety of reasons. First, again, the type of jobs that they hold they are not the type of jobs you can do from home. Second, they tend to live in multi-generational households. And third, many of them lack access to affordable healthcare services. The, the next uh, slides, please. The Howard County General Hospital and the Howard County Health Department uh, publish uh, this 2019 Howard County Community Health Assessment Needs. 
both of these organizations, the hospital and the health department, speak of health equity in their mission statements. In this report, they acknowledge that despite the many resources in the community, data shows that there's still significant health disparity. A survey was conducted among 2000 Howard County residents back in 2012 to better understand the health status. And from that data gathered, they identified five community health priorities. And you can move to the next slides. This was access to care, healthy weight, healthy aging, behavioral health, maternal infant health. Of these areas, I will highlight areas where we know there are inequities and health disparities as it relates to the Latino community in Howard County. Access to care is truly very limited for this uh, population as the great majority of them lack access to affordable health insurance or just plain lack of access to health insurance at all. They, due to their immigration status, many of them are not eligible for Medicaid, nor are they eligible for the Affordable Care Act. We in, here in Howard County are fortunate that uh, there is a federally qualified health center in the county, uh, that is uh, Chase Braxton Healthcare, the Columbia Center. And this is a place uh, where anyone can access primary care services regardless of their ability to pay. And the majority of this Latino population seek care there. I work for that organization uh, for about nine years and, uh, and truly is a godsend for, for these individuals. Behavioral health also is very limited if you uh, don't have health insurance. So the resources that are available for this community to uh, care of their behavioral health needs is very, very narrow. Again, Chase Braxton steps up to the plate because they offer services uh, for uh, behavioral health. And now, uh, thanks to an initial grant that the Horizon Foundation provided to the Howard County Public Schools, the schools are offering school-based behavioral health services that have benefited greatly the Latino uninsured children and they can receive those services right at the school. This is a program that we are hoping gets expanded to all schools in the county through funding uh, in the budget of the Howard County Public Schools. Last, maternal and infant health. So this is the one service where we as a county have really failed to provide equal access to prenatal care to all women that reside in Howard County. Next slide. On the 2019 report card of community health indicator, this is a, a document that is published by uh, the Howard County Health Department when they uh, highlighted the area of maternal and infant health, 10.7, and this is data from 2017, 10.7% uh, of Hispanic Latino women received late or no prenatal care. That is more than double than what you see from non-white, non-Hispanic white women. So as you can see, the picture that, I, that I'm painting clearly indicates that health equity for the Latino community is really not yet a reality. What can be done to move the needle towards health equity for the Latino population? So again, we are very fortunate that in the county, we do have a federally qualified health center an FQAC, Chase Braxton. And if you move to the next slide, uh, it will, 
show you, I was able to get these flyers from them. So they, of all the services. So these, th this particular um, health center is, is, a, is a full service center. They offer primary care. And the primary care is for pediatrics, adults. Uh, they offer uh, pediatric and adult gender affirming care. They offer GYN, OB, not yet at the Columbia Center. They offer infectious disease care. They offer pediatric care. They offer behavioral health, including access to psychiatry, uh, substance use uh, treatment services. They have a pharmacy. They have in staff, they have social workers, uh, uh, people that can evaluate and find if the person is eligible for insurance, and if not, a system. Uh, they, so basically, it's a full service uh, clinic. And we are very lucky because at least now they have some access. And some of the staff is bilingual. The other thing that, that has been very close to my heart, it's really been the lack of, of prenatal care. Uh, Howard County used to have a prenatal care that serviced the women that were uninsured. And it was a clinic that was run by the health department. But about maybe 10 to 12 years ago, that clinic had to be basically uh, eliminated because of drastic cuts that were made to the health department. Uh, their budget, I think, was cut almost in half. So clearly, that was one of the services they eliminated when they had to choose what services the health department was going to do. Okay. So fortunately, there's been a lot of advocacy. And, you know, I, my entire time that I worked at, at Chase Braxton, we really tried tirelessly uh, to bring back prenatal care to the county. Uh, Chase Braxton was willing to make that happen, but we needed to have a partner in the hospital because obviously uh, Howard County General Hospital is the only hospital in the county. And in order for you to be able to offer uh, a prenatal care program, you need the hospital to be a willing partner. Uh, for the longest time, that wasn't happening. But fortunately, it seems like the stars are aligning and in, in that it may happen. There's been uh, a group uh, called Howard County Health Equity that has been meeting. Uh, and we have been uh, advocating uh, from the Howard County exec to include money in, in the budget to bring back uh, prenatal care to the county. The problem is the sustainability of that. So we are trying to see if in Howard County we can get implemented a program similar to what Montgomery County has, which is a maternity partnership program where they bring to the table the providers of the care, so the, the OBGYNs or the midwives, the hospitals, and then the patient themselves, they have to also contribute financially so the program can be sustained. So we are hoping that that would happen. Aside from that, in, the, in Maryland at large, there was um, a bill that was that came from the uh, House that was presented. And my next slide has uh, this is really hot off the press because this was this happened last week. So we still don't know uh, what what is going to happen. But the bill actually passed both chambers. So this is uh, is called the Maryland Medical Assistance Program. Children and Pregnant Women Healthy Babies Equity Act. So basically what this is, is in, in a synopsis, this is requiring 
requiring that the Maryland Medical Assistance Program to provide comprehensive medical care and other health care services to non-citizen pregnant women who would qualify for the program. Uh, but currently, they don't because of their immigration status. So this is going to require for Maryland to apply for some waivers because this is happening in, I think, 18 other states in the nation that they're able to offer um, prenatal care to women regardless of their immigration status during the pregnancy and for the postpartum period. So we were very fortunate that this bill passed both the House and the Senate and it's now uh, at, it went to the governor. Uh, it passed with veto-proof majority. So even if the governor vetoes the bill, it, it can still, uh, if, if it comes back while there's still a session, they can overturn the veto. Uh, so we are hoping that the governor will sign, but we're hoping that it, that it will pass because this then will make it, uh, will bring equity to this particular sector of the population. And here in Howard County, the great majority of the women that will benefit from, benefit from this are gonna be the Latino uh, women that are undocumented. So as you can see, vet, vet, there's really not much health equity when it comes to, to health uh, for the Latino population in the county. Uh, we're working towards making things better because everybody has the right to health care, but is a really big challenge. So that is really all I had to talk about. So if you have any questions that I can answer, uh, Please do. Yes, uh, Dr. Kendall, we do have a question in the uh, chat section. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, as a community nonprofit, what can we do to help? So I think, you know, as a community, what we can do is really advocate that, that this type of services do, be, do get provided in the county. So I think if if uh, uh, if it came to uh, to your attention, we often look for uh, nonprofit organizations to support the effort. And I guess we will be uh, knocking on your doors if we need more people to sign up uh, for to to help us push this through. Fortunately. The, the bill that passed, it was not just related. So it was not just Howard County. This was something that was uh, being advocated through Casa de Maryland. And we got involved and uh, many of us provided testimony, uh, but it, it's not just exclusive to Howard County, it's for the entire state, uh, which we're really happy for. But basically it's just support that health should be the same for all access to health really needs to be the same. Great, and I guess that, that brings up a, a question I have. You talked a, a bit about the uh, undocumented and uh, some of the other issues they face. Obviously, it's, it's a political issue as well as a, mm -hmm. uh, a health issue. Uh, what are your, some of your thoughts, regardless of, of politics, that you think can be done to help support these folks in the future? Uh, as we continue to move out of the pandemic and back to hopefully a somewhat uh, semi or fully normal life, since many of them, as, as, as you know better than I do, that are in service jobs or other frontline jobs. Right, so there's a lot, unfortunately, there's a lot of distrust in this community, uh, you know, and often, often these, uh, these parents are even afraid to seek services that they are, that their kids are entitled to, because you know many of these kids that have been born here, they are U.S. citizens, and often they have access to services that the parents may not accept or even apply for because they're afraid of flagging themselves, and uh, 
you know, and that particularly, you know, during the previous administration because of all the issues that how political it, it got, you know, my daughter is an assistant principal in one of the schools here in the county. And, and the parents were very afraid to even accept any services that the school was trying to offer because of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's just having empathy and compassion for these people, you know, they are here, you know, it's like you said, it's, it's a very political, uh, char politically charged topic, uh, but these people are very hardworking and they are here doing jobs that often there's no one else that can do them. And so they really bring a lot to the table. And, you know, these, these people don't want hand-me-downs. You know, these people, they, they like to pay for the services they receive. They just want them to be affordable so they can afford them. You know, uh, when I was working at Chase Braxton, these patients often they were, you know, put on a sliding scale fee and they, they, they pay for what they receive, you know, so they are, and, and, and they are not really looking for, for free care. They're looking for having access to affordable health care. I want to remind our audience, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat section, then we can, can read them. Uh, Dr. Kento, another uh, question that, that uh, I have relates to the language uh, barrier. Obviously, uh, that is an, a major issue as well, not only a, a understanding, but a trust factor as well. If someone doesn't uh, understand the language or there's some difficulty communicating with a provider, and I understand that Chase Brexton, I'm sure, is one that, that does have uh, uh, Spanish-speaking uh, providers and other services. But uh, can you speak about that uh, situation in the county? Yes. Yeah, so, so that really is a, a big uh, problem and, and barrier. Uh, at Chase Brexton, like you said, they do have bilingual staff, and they also have uh, resources to access uh, for uh, medical translation. Uh, in, in most, and in, in the hospital also provides that service. So they provide uh, interpreters uh, to, to translate, uh, not, not just Spanish, but many other languages. But that is really a, a big barrier because they feel more comfortable if they can speak in their own language. And, and often, unfortunately, they even use their own children as the, the ones that they bring to the off, office visits so they can help uh, facilitate if the, if the provider of care doesn't speak Spanish. Uh, we are also very fortunate in Howard County that we also have uh, luminous uh, previously called FERN. So they also uh, provide services of translation uh, for uh, Spanish speaking patients to help them navigate the healthcare system. About a year ago, we had a speaker, uh, two speakers actually, one from Johns Hopkins and uh, a uh, community member in the city of Baltimore who was talking about the issues around the hesitation with, with vaccinations. And uh, I was wondering how much of an issue that's been in the, the uh, Spanish speaking community in Howard County. Fortunately in Howard County, a, a, a great effort was put into communication with the Latino population. I myself participated in several um, town hall type uh, discussions that were conducted through Facebook, uh, Facebook Live, and, uh, and, and we were able to reach uh, a lot of, of Latinos uh, that way. So in Howard County, actually, the acceptance of the vaccine was way higher than in other communities. So we, we did a really good job. It, it really helped that um, the communities of faith also partner, you know, because I know uh, at St. John's, uh, 
the evangelists, they had uh, vaccination uh, clinics and, uh, and that helped make it easier for the, uh, the, the Spanish congregation. Uh, St. John has a really large Spanish congregation. Right. So that made it really easier for them. But here in the county, and also the health department also did a great job at uh, producing information in Spanish flyers, you know, so it, it made it a lot easier to dismiss all the, the, the things that were not true about the vaccine. And, and also answer the questions honestly, you know, because at the beginning, you know, this, this uh, pandemic, the, the hardest challenge was is that we did not know what we were dealing with and the information was changing quickly you know so what you knew today it could be different tomorrow and there was a lot of skepticism about how quickly we develop a vaccine but when you really get down to the details on how this came about it wasn't really by chance you know Th this vaccine uh, was possible because there was cooperation throughout the world like never before. Private and public cooperation, you know, pri private industry, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the public, uh, the governments, uh, the technology of these vaccines is not a new vaccine. The, the COVID-19 is a new virus, but the coronaviruses are not new. You know, so we have known about coronaviruses uh, for the longest time. So there was information there that made it possible. And because of the cooperation, it was possible to come up and people volunteered uh, like never before to to receive this vaccine in the studies. So, it, it, you know, we are very, very fortunate, you know, and we are very lucky in this country and all the developed countries, you know, but unfortunately this pandemic is not gonna end. It, we, we, are th we are in this in two years because we need to remember that it's a pandemic. So if the entire world doesn't get vaccinated, we are not going to really achieve that herd immunity, you know, that we are fortunate that we have had the vaccines and the availability to get boosters. And then with this Omicron uh, variant, uh, so many people even that get vaccinated got infected because it was a lot more transmitted. So likely of us, um, the next surge may probably is not going to be as bad because we are closer to having that herd immunity that, that we have heard about. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's really, uh, really uh, a patience game. Right, right, exactly. It's a, it's a longer term game. Mm -hmm. as opposed to short term. We yes. have another uh, question in the chat. It says, do uh, you see better equity in healthcare for documented Latinos versus undocumented? We, we do because the documented Latinos uh, would have access uh, to health insurance. So they, therefore they will be able to get at least the health services. There's still gonna be, uh, you know, some disparities, but not as much as for the undocumented. To ask my uh, my co-chair, Aurelio Rodriguez, I mean, um, Rodriguez. Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking of oh my the favorite baseball player. Sorry, Lee. Oh <laughs> my God. All right, well, uh, I, I blew that one, so. So uh, uh, Lee Rojas, uh, Aurelio Lopez, Ro <laughs> never mind, forget it, Lee. Ask your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I was just trying to think about you know, what you're saying about undocumented. And this is an ongoing issue. 
And you know, right now the, the federal government is not engaged. So how can we as private citizens do a better job of trying to encourage people to do that, to get the, the health care because you know, it's, it's a sin. Doctor? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's really just being, uh, encouraging people. Like if you, if you, if you know, you know, like I, I, I know a, a lot, uh, having a practice uh, in this county, I had a really large uh, amount of undocumented uh, Latino patients that I still get to see because I still live in the same community, you know, and I worship in the same spaces that they worship. So, uh, but those are the ones that I know uh, seek care and they, and they really try, you know, and they really care for their health and, and they really try to do what's best. So as a community, I think what we need to do is uh, look out for for them, you know, recognize that they're here, they're part, they're contributing members of society. You know, they they are part of our economy. You know, these people live and work here. And uh, and we just need to be supportive of them. Doctor, there is another question. Um, there's been 17 other states that have similar legislation, and they've managed to acquire the necessary federal waivers. Are there, mo are, are there models we could lo look into to assist in expanding our outreach and inclusion of those families and individuals being left out of the healthcare system mix, especially with the women and children? Right, so that is what we are hoping that this uh, health, Healthy Babies Act will accomplish is that Maryland will also get that waiver. So then those uh, moms can uh, really uh, have access to care during their prenatal, you know, time, but also cover them through that postpartum period up to a year. Uh, the, the babies, once they're born, they are immediately eligible for medical assistance so they can get the health insurance. But, uh, you know, we are really uh, happy. I'm personally really happy that this uh, bill passed because I, I see that, that this will be a game changer for, for these uh, families. Should, should citizens of Maryland, because unfortunately I'm not, even with my name changed to Rodriguez. Uh, you can't play baseball as well as him either. So. <laughs> should citizens of America, you know, would you encourage them or how could we, we can't because of our status, but how would you encourage them to reach out to the legislatures? And again, legislators, excuse me. See, that's why you called me Rodriguez. I can't speak English. <laughs> how can we encourage our legislators to pursue that. To, so, so basically, it's really through advocacy. You know, uh, when when we were trying to um, push and we were looking for people to testify for for these bills, we really had a really large coalition uh, of different organizations in the county that. Uh, were four and, and, and step up to the plate and they set present, you know. And uh, so I think it's just communication. You know, we need to do better at communicating to the general public about these uh, efforts so it can be better supported by the entire community. Yeah, we have a... Uh... Note in the chat uh, that says uh, regarding HB 1080, uh, this is Wesley Queen. I would recommend uh, contacting State Senator Clarence Lamb 
and or Delegate Shane Pendergast. And Thank Senator you. Lamb testified in support of the bill and Delegate Pendergast's committee had responsibility for the bill. Right, and they, and they did, they, they, both of them did uh, a wonderful job because they both in the House and in the Senate it passed with veto-proof majority. Well, uh, yes. I'll, I'll ask a few other comments to answer the question that you are referring to. Um, in this last week of the session, veto-proof majorities would apply to a lot of bills so that <laughs> it, it would take, take a little more, in my view, than that to, to move this move this further. And that's why, yes, there are a number of bills that pass with veto-proof majorities, but I think the, uh, the line's gonna be very long on that. And uh, so I think if you wanted to um, get some more uh, muscle, if you will, behind this, I would suggest you contact Senator Lamb uh, or, and or uh, Delegate um, Pendergrass so that, that that would be my 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 recommendation if you want to move this move this further in this last week of the session. Um, so that thank you, thank you. That will be very helpful. Wesley, I had a question. What happens if the um, governor doesn't veto this bill? Just 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 lets it ride. Then it goes past the end of the session and it's automatically vetoed. There's no. No, I don't no. understand how that works. All right. If if he if he does not veto it and uh -huh. goes through the end of the session, it it would become law. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. It it would automatically become law. And that and that could well be what's what's planned. In other words, if if he does not veto it, that that's that's a good thing, because if he vetoes this particular bill, because we're in the last year of the term. Right, it will not. There will be no veto overrides next year. Right. Uh -huh. And so, I don't know. And I don't know that there's enough time because uh, the, the session ends when Monday. next next week. Next, next Monday, Monday at twelve midnight. Mm. Right. So there's not enough. No. If he if he vetoes it, then there's not enough no, time no. to do that because he, then they will have to start again. That's correct. If he vetoes, it's dead. That's right. right. Yes. So they can't call a special session to, to do anything about that? Well, you, uh, you could call, you would call a special session, but bear in mind, we have a primary coming up. Right, that's true. And yeah. all the individuals who are running need to get out and run. <laughs> there isn't enough right. time for a special session that to me would address this particular issue. As you know, we had a discussion on the redistricting legislation, right. uh, which, was, which the governor finally signed. If we were going to have a special session, that would be the bill that would would take priority over all the other bills. But that may not be the well, probably would not be the case. But in any case, the upcoming primary is a significant factor with respect to a special session. So I don't think we'll see a special session because of the primary. I see. I see a hand up on Dana, but I think Dana. I, Dana provided a comment yeah. in the, uh, in the uh, chat. Yeah, I, I Dana, worked in you Annapolis. Want to expand on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I worked in Annapolis for a number of years. So I was just wanting to add to the conversation. So basically, um, as was said, because it's an election year, anything that's vetoed now that you you start from square one in the next session, you right. can't take, do a veto override. The circumstance of this is that they had to, if legislation passed by this past Friday, it would have to go to the governor's desk. The governor has to respond within a certain amount of time. And the two ways to pass legislation are actively as in with a signature, signed it into law or passively passes without a signature, um, depending on how they suspend the rules um, or not. Uh, but that, those are kind of the standard rules and more or less anything that passes after Friday, this past Friday, is subject to the regular calendar where 30 days after, within 30 days after the legislative session, bills have to be presented to the governor and then the governor has to make a decision in essence by the end of May. Um, so lots of things can happen. And I would say I highly doubt that a special session will happen right. um, because 
unless it's related to the redistricting and there's an appeal related to that, it's highly unlikely that any other issue will rise to that level. Um, because even in the pandemic, they didn't do a special they didn't do a special session on funding for COVID relief. So I can't imagine they do that for this legislation, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's just Annapolis. But also remember, um, Annapolis is always kind of crazy. There are rules and rules around the rules. And in an election year, I tell people all the time, it's like the Twilight Zone meets Alice in Wonderland. So crazy things happen and they will literally go till midnight. And I've heard of stories where sometimes things don't happen by midnight and they pause the clock. And so the clock doesn't technically turn till midnight till later. So just anything can happen. <laughs> A, a question for you, uh, Dr. Kenda, related to uh, data. You know, one of the issues that's come out of the 2020 census was an undercounting of uh, certain uh, groups, and uh, obviously, data impacts how money gets allocated and, and mm -hmm. a number of other things. Um, and there's there's also issues around data, whether how people self-identify themselves and, and right. things of that sort. Um, what kind of thoughts do you have on that whole issue? Because some people say it leads to a, a large undercounting of uh, Latinos. Uh, there's issues around how people self-identify or don't identify themselves because of uh, various reasons. Uh, what, what do you think can be done in that regard? You know, I, I, that is really a big issue because particularly the census was happening when this pandemic was declared. Uh, so the, the efforts to mobilize, you know, to, to assure that, that people will respond to the census were limited. And uh, so I don't necessarily think that the account of, of, of of the people that are here in the county, particularly these uh, populations that that we are talking about, they probably are undercounted, you know. So I think it's in in the future for future census is is really more education, more outreach, more, you know, boots on the ground, getting to talk to these people so they understand that. The, that this, you know, them identifying themselves is not gonna harm them. If anything is gonna be helpful because as you said, that is how money gets allocated, right. you know, depending on, on, on the census. So it's just basically education, but for that you need uh, a lot of boots on the ground, getting people out there, uh, in the spaces where you find the these populations, you know, in the faith communities, in the, you know, the for this particular population here in Howard County, I think there is a a, a place in Route One where uh, it's like a like a big market that they uh, like a flea market. So th there was a lot of outreach there, um, but all that got halted. Uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, but I know that a lot of the education that we tried to do uh, around uh, vaccination, once things were a little bit under more control, it was visiting the spaces where, where this population was, you know, the soccer fields, because that's where that, these uh, families go, uh, just to try to meet them where they are. As, as, um... You work now for the largest private insurance company in Maryland, and I know at the national level, uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and a lot of the blues have started uh, taking a more active role in health equity issues. What are uh, some of the things that Care First is doing in, uh, to promote uh, health equity? So they are trying to really support uh, nonprofits that service uh, communities like the Latino community in the way of grants uh, for, I know that there was a lot of uh, grant making around 
vaccine promotion, you know, uh, about uh, access to, to food, you know, for places in food insecurity. Uh, so that's how Care First has responded, you know, through their philanthropic uh, arm. Uh, but I know that they're now they have incorporated a public health arm within the health services department, which is where I work. And that is good because that is going to um, broaden the, the view. And, and I think uh, they are really trying as best they can uh, to really bring equity, true equity, but it's just gonna take time. Uh, but I think they are, they are trying, you know. Lee, did you have another question? It looked like you were appeared on the screen for a moment. Did you I'm just trying to get myself together. No, I'm fine. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, other questions from the uh, community? Ellen? You want to talk about the issue of trust? Yeah, I, I just think, you know, the biggest issue here is um, that we encountered during the pandemic with um, um, minorities on a large scale. Um, not just um, illegals, but those who feel they've been marginalized or cut out is, is really the issue of trust. And how do you communicate honestly and um, establish relationships and then deliver on the promises because um, that hasn't been revealed in the past necessarily. And that's, and with a group that has a different status in different situations, it becomes even more difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the schools, you cannot ask those questions. Okay, so services delivered to children within the school system um, should be without any worries about, about opening something up and, and making something difficult. These are not questions that can be asked. And yet parents are fearful. And so mm -hmm. Um, they don't come forward and, and children, you know, don't want to create issues. And um, often, as you related earlier, the children are the communicators. I mean, they're, they're the ones that are trying to bridge, you know, the two pieces. And um, unless we can really face up to the fact that this is a, a challenge we have to meet and um, that um, the trust has to be earned, it, it doesn't just, it doesn't just happen. Um, we're going to continue to have these kinds of issues. So uh, very grateful for the work that you've done. And I, I will be a little more helpful than my friends in the legislature that once something's gotten to this stage and once you've gotten it through um, with strong supports, um, next year isn't impossible. It, it may delay things, but um, it often takes things three shots to get through. <laughs> or more so so you know i'm i'm encouraged that, that that this may get there and then we have to look at what we do on the federal level in order to on a broader scale look at at, at how we manage to reach people who live in two worlds mm -hmm. <laughs> so true i had a question for you uh, dr kendo about the uh Howard County General, which of course has been uh, under Johns Hopkins for uh, a number of years. And as, as you know, a large number of the uninsured end up, uh, you know, going to the hospital emergency rooms and things of that sort. Uh, uh, you, you alluded to them a little bit in some of the health equity uh, discussion. Uh, can you kind of elaborate uh, more on that? And has it gotten better since they've become part of Hopkins? Is there things that Hopkins is doing at a larger level that could support the health equity in the county? So actually, they, so, so Howard County uh, General has been under Hopkins uh, for a little over 20 years. Uh, and the reason I, I, I know that is because the Howard County, uh, the Horizon Foundation actually got formed when that, when Hopkins uh, purchased uh, Howard County General. So I personally, when I was working with uh, Chase Braxton and with the Horizon Foundation, we have been trying to get Hopkins to 
come to the table, particularly for the prenatal, they, they have been very helpful because for, for Chase Braxton, they have had a wonderful relationship helping the uninsured. And basically when they get seen at the hospital in the emergency room, when, when patients uh, show up at the, at the hospital and if they don't have insurance, they know they can send them to Chase Braxton so they can at least establish care um, and, and have uh, primary care services. And uh, so Hopkins has been very helpful in that sense. When it came to the prenatal, what we were trying to get them to do is to really create that relationship. The, the women show up at their doorsteps anyway. you know. So the majority of the women that are uh, undocumented, that are pregnant, they, they come to Chase Braxton looking for services for prenatal care, but during the time that I was there and they still don't have it at the Columbia office, there were no prenatal services given there. Chase Braxton's did offer prenatal services at other offices in Baltimore and in Glen Burnie, but then that meant that the woman had to get to those other offices. So that created another uh, set of issues around transportation because many of these households only have one car. So basically they have to depend on public transportation, which is really not good because it's not reliable. But even if the woman went out of the county to receive the prenatal care, <clears throat> Often when they went into labor, they will show up at Howard County General anyway. But once they get there, then they will they they would not know that they received prenatal care. So they basically treated them like they received no prenatal care at all. So then they do all these battery of tests that they already had done. So it's like du duplicative services just because they would not... Um, Agree, we, we attempted for many years to say, let's do this together, establish a line of communication. If they show up in, in your hospital in labor, you can contact us. We can provide the prenatal care uh, history and records if they did receive it. But at that time, it was they were just not coming to the table uh, willingly. So there's been change in leadership and, and now they, they have an understanding that we can make this happen, you know, and especially when the women uh, show up in labor, I think they can apply for like emergency medical assistance. So I think they do get cover for the delivery, but now they, they are willing to create that partnership and uh, so even if this um, bill that passed in the Maryland legislation doesn't happen, we are really hoping that at least as a bridge until, until something happens at the state level, that we can create that partnership between Chase Braxton and the hospital and have some funding from the Howard County government to create this program, this maternity partnership program. Uh, and so, so that's what we're crossing our fingers that it will happen. Uh, you know, Dr. Ball is very receptive to the idea, uh, but of course we need to think at a longer terms on something that is uh, sustainable. And that is really where the problem you know, is. So ideally, if this uh, bill were to become law, then that will take care of, of the sustainability because then we will only need this bridge to make it happen now until this becomes law. So yeah, I think, I think a, a lot of moving parts, but you know, the hospital is critical because we only have one hospital. You know, and we just need to uh, uh, continue to push and, 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 and push Hopkins because Hopkins does a lot in the city. Uh, 
and they support, you know, a lot of uh, different programs in the city that that uh, support the Latino community, but they need to do th the same here in the county. I think, uh, well, the, the, the latest uh, national budget, the FY23 budget contained a lot of uh, information and uh, funding for health equity, including maternal care and the fact that most of the federal health agencies other than the CDC are headquartered in the Maryland area. One would hope that that would get some of that down to the General Assembly and, thus, and, and also to places like Hopkins who play such a major role in our, in our uh, metropolitan area to, mm -hmm. to help provide that better support. Uh, so we can all, as a, as a group, I think we can help advocate uh, and uh, certainly just having you speak tonight, we appreciate all the information and, uh, and uh, thoughts and everything you've given to us. Uh, let me just uh, ask uh, the uh, audience, is there any final questions for Dr. Kendo? I may, I may have one. If Wes Go ahead, Wes. It's, it's, it's a dollar and cents question, so it probably, probably it's not the appropriate question to ask, but under the structure of a federally qualified health, health center, as I understand it, it is, of course, uh, the fees are not its major revenue source. That most of it's, it's on a sliding scale, I think they call it. And mm -hmm. it, therefore, many of its services are not profitable, to use a dollar and cents word. So if they were to expand the service at, here in Columbia, would it be a loss? A loss leader, as they talk in the retail business, would it be a loss leader? If they, if they were to expand to offer prenatal care, is, is what you're asking? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, they, they are masters at uh, juggling. And, uh, you know, and uh, fortunately, they, they reach out uh, to a lot of organizations that uh, provide grants. So that's how they're able to they do a lot of fundraising. Uh, you know, Chase Raxon does a lot of fundraising. So I'm going to put a plug there and I'll send the information. They're, they're, they're having a major fundraising that is going to happen in May. And uh, so I'll send the information so you can disseminate it. So if anybody wants to uh, uh, participate in that fundraiser, uh, we will be happy. You know, I am one of the co-chairs of, of that is, is a gala, but, it's, but they're doing it in a different way. They used to hold them in hotels, uh, but this, this time is gonna be uh, six different homes. And one of the homes is here in Howard County. Uh, some, somebody that is in the board of Chase Braxton is opening their home to host an event and uh, they're gonna, uh, require that everybody that attends is vaccinated. Uh, so to, to be safe, uh, but it, it's basically, they do a lot of fundraising to be able to provide services. I understand. I'll make one other comment. I took a quick look at HB 1080. I didn't read the whole bill, but I think as in many pieces of legislation, there's a provision in there that says that it would be funded provided that the state's budget is sufficient enough to fund this going forward. So just something I think, uh, I get to look at it again, but suggest that in this year, that's fine. We're, we're at a state, state has a budget surplus and probably will have one next year, but just something to think about and take a look at that going in the out years, there, and as many cases, there's restriction on programs based on the budget for the state. I think that provision is in there. So that's what I do. As an FYI, I'll just put it out there. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any final questions for Dr. Kenda before we let her go? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I just want to say, Tony, before you end, this has been a uh, superb evening. Thank you for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having the interest in this. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as Bill said, it was, a, it was a really informative, really well done. So we appreciate you taking the time and 
we may call on you again to uh, come back and talk to us some more about this area or other areas because uh, we really appreciate your uh, insights and uh, the group uh, as a whole uh, really wants to be supportive of the work you do and the work that uh, Chase Brexton and others do in this area. Thank you. So, so Pat, are you or Mary uh, are going to know? Well, Mary, Mary's going to wrap up, but I 